All right, by now it is no secret that our trillions of gut microbes living within are not the biggest fan of antibiotics, mainly due to them being the exact target these lab-derived medicines were built to destroy. And this has been one of the main reasons, at least over the last decade or so, why people have become more cautious with how much they take. However, what has really not been considered too much is the impact that these antibiotics may pose on the gut independent of their effects on the microbiome. That is, until now. And I'll just say, I was quite surprised with what this new research found. Let's take a look. Yo, 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 what is up? Welcome back to another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and longevity and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic way. Today, we are back in our smelly, happy place, the gut. This time, exploring a potential driver of dysfunction, which most researchers never really considered before gut microbe independent antibiotic disruption, meaning negative effects on the all important gut wall due to antibiotics, but as alluded to before, not because they altered gut bacteria into some nefarious wall destroyers. These are changes derived from the antibiotics themselves. Now, as we all know, and what has been repeatedly observed in research throughout the last decade, broad spectrum antibiotics or antibiotics built specifically to attack and destroy a broad range of bacterial pathogens do in fact alter the microbiome, often in a way which ends up depleting beneficial communities of microbes, especially when combined with poor lifestyle habits like they often are. And this right here has been the longtime hypothesis on why their chronic use and overuse, an unfortunate commonality in today's Western world, seem to be linked to a growing number of metabolic conditions, most notably obesity, diabetes, and IBS. However, New evidence, which we are going to touch on today, suggests that this may not be the full story and that this antibiotic impact may have another modality of action, making their unnecessary consumption an even more important thing to keep your eye on if you have ambitions of living long and finishing strong, which if you're here, I assume is an interest. So before we get into all that, and to truly appreciate the data that we're about to go through, you need some basic background on how the gut wall and microbiome interact. Because if you recall from this video here, although our microbes, when balanced properly, bring about a laundry list of potential benefits, our body or our self cells don't necessarily love to interact with their smelly neighbors, whether they be classified good or bad. In fact, they hate to interact with these gut microbes so much that when they do, they call the police, AKA the immune system. Yeah, talk about being woke. That being said, there's no reason to panic. And I'll tell you why, because millions of years of primate evolution came up with a solution for this, a natural buffer, specifically one made of mucus, Sounds magical, right? Maintained by a constant secretion from our gut goblet cells, this slimy barrier forms a stern yet selectively permeable buffer between our self gut cells and our non-self microbes. And this is how evolution has allowed us to have the best of both worlds, a thriving ecosystem of metabolite producing microbes within without the immune alarms of invasion constantly causing an inflammatory nightmare. That is when the system is working properly. But unfortunately, the modern day reality is anything but that. As the common Western societal norms of 24-7 ultra-processed eating, indoor sedentary behavior, chemicals and pharmaceuticals everywhere, and chronically disaligned deprived sleep end up doing something we really can't afford. Deplete this oh-so-critical slimy barrier, creating an environment of direct microbe-to-gut contact, and by extension, immune contact and unfortunately leading to a whole array of inflammatory issues that 
if not fixed, systemically travel throughout the body, impacting the cellular function of all the major organ systems in a health deteriorating way, and thus a longevity deteriorating way. Yikes is right. And up until this point, the main thought was that these suboptimal habits drive shifts in the microbiome composition, which in turn deplete the mucus barrier, which has pretty much shown to be true throughout the last decade or so of research. However, these two new studies uncover some critical new information about this picture. Let's take a look. Researchers at Umea University and Tartu University sought to see if antibiotic use alone was associated with microbe independent negative effects in the gut of mammals. They first started out by analyzing the microbiomes of two carefully selected groups of humans, one of which had taken several courses of antibiotics over the last few years, but none in the six months leading up to the study, with the other claiming to not have taken a dose of antibiotics for at least 10 years. And upon stool analysis, which is always fun, they observed that there were, in fact, noticeable changes to gut composition in the antibiotic group, even though they hadn't taken anything for at least six months. Interesting, but not as interesting as this next part. From here, they transferred the microbiota from this group of antibiotic-taking participants into germ-free mice, interestingly observing that the function of the mucus layer in these mice became disrupted, finding that expansion of mucus was reduced and the layer overall became more penetrable, allowing bacteria to move closer to the intestinal lining. Exactly what we don't want. And when they analyzed these microbes in more detail, they found that bacteria known to feed on the mucus layer were in higher abundance. Interesting. And not ideal. But who's to say that these mucus-eating bacteria aren't just the byproduct of poor habits rather than the antibiotics themselves? Good point. Enter this next study, which investigated this very question. Researchers administered the common antibiotic vancomycin to regular and germ-free mice, honing in on the potential impact on the gut wall while keeping all other controllable variables constant. And the findings were quite surprising. They observed that the antibiotics could impede mucus secretion in the colon by inducing endoplasmic reticulum stress in colonic cells. Oh, finding that its impairment of the colon's goblet cells to secrete mucus started just minutes after the antibiotic administration, resulting in a stark reduction in overall secretion rates. Super interesting. But again, how do we know for sure that it's the antibiotics doing this? Well, to check this, researchers then transferred the microbiomes of these antibiotic-infused mice to germ-free mice, where they did not observe the same mechanisms at play. You don't say. Having them conclude that some antibiotics have a deleterious effect on the mucus barrier, in part by acting directly on the host gut cells, independent of the organism's microbiome itself. Now, they also made the clear yet important call out, reminding the astute microbiome geeks like you and I, that this does not mean that the microbiome-induced problems are not happening as well. They're not mutually exclusive. Both microbiome and antibiotic-independent effects are likely taking place, which uh, ain't cool for longevity school. Bringing us to the question, is there anything we can do about this smelly dilemma? A loaded question indeed, but one which there's plenty to talk about. And the place we need to start is by addressing that prescription pad in the room, antibiotics. Because this does not mean that they're evil and need to be shunned from society. They have done a lot of good and saved a shitload of lives. And we should be grateful for that and appreciative that we have them as a tool. Now, 
That being said, we have entered an era where broad-spectrum antibiotics have and continue to be leisurely prescribed in a very precautionary manner. And this is something to be aware of, because even though it may feel like the easy, safe option in the here and now, unless discussed and determined to be absolutely necessary by your doctor, there are likely better paths forward. And you may be wondering, what exact better options are there? You may not like this answer. The best option is doing all of that preventative stuff, which makes it biologically harder for a pathogen to compromise your system and get you to a point where you need antibiotics in the first place. Yeah, this can in fact be done. And might I add, the very same stuff or habits that drive this cellular efficiency also do something equally important. They cultivate your ecosystem of microbes within to be as beneficial and health promoting as possible. Funny how it works like that. And even if you're at this point, like so many other people in this modern world, stuck in this tired, lethargic, sore, achy, sick every few months cycle, these habits happen to be exactly what can break you out of it, helping you reclaim what is rightfully yours, feeling effing awesome, feeling how you're capable of feeling each and every damn day. Welcome to the world of owning your health and owning your outcome. It's nice to have you. Here are some cellular health and micro-modulating factors when it comes to doing just this. First, eating real whole nourishing foods. The foods naturally packed with dietary fiber, high quality protein, healthy fats, and micronutrients. Not only will this put your cells in a position to thrive, but these foods, specifically the fibers and phytonutrients in them, act as a fertilizer for beneficial mucus layer promoting short chain fatty acids secreting bacteria to thrive. Supplementing with a high quality probiotic, especially especially in the case where antibiotics were necessary, can be helpful too. But do your research because not all probiotics are created equal. As we discussed here, if you're looking for a good place to start, I personally like the symbiotic from seed. Next, we have the goat of habits, high quality circadian aligned sleep. And this is mandatory if you want even a shot of operating efficiently at the cellular level, as sleep is critical for immune system health and function. Kind of a key component if you don't wanna get sick, but it doesn't stop there. It has also been discovered that both our microbes and our cells operate on a 24 hour circadian clock. Both need rest and a break from the digestion to rejuvenate. So waking and going to bed with the sun, giving yourself an eight hour plus sleep window each night and performing a strategic 12 plus hour overnight fast can work wonders. Oh, and we can't forget the biological boosting powers of some good old badonka donking, AKA exercise. Not only is it one of the best ways to promote cellular health via its mitochondria enhancing effects, but research has shown that consistent exercise is associated with both a better diversity and a more beneficial species of gut microbes. And as we reviewed here, our microbes are likely necessary for optimizing the adaptive response to exercise because they produce a key metabolite for muscle protein synthesis. So help your microbes help you get them gains. The last big habit we have is the all-important nature. Why, you ask? Because being out in it, our OG natural environment, might I add, triggers a biochemical shift within that improves every aspect of our cellular and metabolic function. Oh, and that's where most of the microbes live too. So the more nature you consume, earth you touch, and dirty you get, the more microdiverse you will likely become and the more tuned your immune system will be. So go roll in the grass already. Finally, since we're speaking of getting dirty, assessing and mitigating the harsh chemicals, cleaning supplies, fragrances, body care items, and pharmaceuticals, all things that can disrupt both your cellular and microbiome function, is important to get on the list too. So make an effort to look for natural alternatives, ideally ones that are made with natural organic ingredients. My rule of thumb is, if I wouldn't feel comfortable eating it, I don't wanna put it on me. A strategy, might I add, that expands your palate quite a bit. 
So wherever you currently are on this journey we call life, and especially if you're on that common path of modern health deteriorating norms, I challenge you to make the intentional decision to deploy the empowering gift of optimism and seize your situation as an opportunity, an opportunity to shift away from the habits of dysfunction and over to the ones of cellular and microbe induced prosperity. Prosperity, which, in the beginning, may be best measured in daily flatulence. What? That's how microbes say thank you. Don't worry, your family will get used to it.